John chapter 14, we're reading verses 1 to 24. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and the Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. About um, a thousand years ago, when I was in grade four at school, uh, a couple who... Uh, So we need to be realistic about John chapter 14 and the way in which the disciples must be feeling. They didn't know this, but it was the last night uh, before Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus, at this point, is alone with his disciples. And Judas Iscariot has left them uh, to do his his dreadful deed. And uh, Jesus has been speaking to them about what is going to happen after his departure. And we've said, we've said a few times already, and I think it's worth saying uh, uh, again, it's this really awful moment for the disciples. 
they've really bet all that they have on Jesus Christ. Uh, they've left family and home and they've spent, they've spent three, now three years with him. And, uh, and, it, and it seems that it's just getting to crunch time. They've come into Jerusalem and the crowds are cheering. And I think uh, more than at any other point in the time in which they've been with him, they feel that now is the time for Jesus to reveal to the whole world that he is the Christ. And Jesus says to them, I'm, I'm going. It's, it's time for me to leave. Now, they might be thinking of all of the times to go. Is now the time to leave? And to add sort of to the difficulty, uh, he speaks about the way in which he is going to leave. He is going to his Father in heaven. He is going to be betrayed. He is going to be killed. Peter is going to reject him. And then at some time down the track, he is going to come again and take them to be with him. Now, I think they must have been anxious. I think they must have been confused. Um, I think they must have felt terribly betrayed. Uh, I, had a, I had a dream. I don't know why I have these dreams. But I had a dream once. I was learning to fly a plane. And it was my first lesson. And uh, the instructor told me what to do and we took off and we flew to a thousand feet and then uh, the instructor said, thanks very much, you've done very well and then jumped out with a parachute. <laughs> They're stupid dreams, aren't they? But that was not the time for the instructor to jump out with a parachute. I wonder if the disciples feel something like that but worse. It's as if Jesus is saying, it's all up to you now, guys. I'm leaving. Now, he said some things, and we've seen that in the last couple of weeks. He's saying, don't be anxious. Why not? Well, one, I'm, I'm going to the cross to prepare a place for you. By his sacrificial death, in their place, he's dealing with Satan and sin and death and establishing a kingdom that will never fail. Remember that, he says. And you need to know that. And secondly, he says, I'm coming back again to take you to be with me forever. There's two bookends. They're really important. You've got to know these things, he says. Um, but the question for them, and as wonderful as those two things are, and they are wonderful, is, well, what about all of the time in between those two things? What about the time now? What about the time in between the bookends? And in the verses that we're looking at from John 14 today, we're looking at what Jesus says is going to happen in, in that time, in, in what the Bible often calls the last days. In our time, in the time that was soon to be for the disciples, the time between the bookends, and, uh, and they are the most wonderful things, and uh, I want to tell you the bottom line right away, lest, lest, lest I put you to sleep somehow for the rest of the sermon. You need to hear this right at the beginning. What Jesus is speaking about in this time here is he's going to send a new helper. And he says that as clearly as day in verse 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Jesus is speaking about the Holy Spirit who he is sending. Jesus is going to the Father and then he will send the Holy Spirit who will come into every Christian in, the, in these last days. And so the question is, what does it mean for Jesus to send the Holy Spirit to his disciples and to us? That's, that's a good question, isn't it? And I'm hoping I can answer that a little bit this morning. But there's a confession I need to make, and it's always bad when you've got to make a confession before a sermon. But here it goes. 
I don't understand everything these passages are talking about. Now, you might not be surprised by that. You might say, well, isn't that just a normal sermon by you, Ross? I don't understand more than I don't normally understand. I understand a lot. I don't understand. There's more I don't understand than I'm normal. Does that make sense? Don't worry about it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to list some things that we see here. I'm going to talk about them. And I think they're wonderful. And I'm hoping you'll sense that they're wonderful as well. Does that sound all right? Let's do that. Number one. Jesus says he's sending another helper who is the spirit of truth. Up until now, Jesus has been their helper. Now Jesus is sending his spirit who will do for them what Jesus has been doing. The word helper is a little tricky. We sort of don't have an English word that fits. The, the, the Greek word is paraclete. And some Bibles just put the word paraclete in. But that doesn't help much, really. We, we know what the word means. It's just that there's not one English word that says all that the word paraclete means. Uh, advocate is one word that we use. It's a legal word. Um, the Holy Spirit comes to be your lawyer. But you may not have a very positive experience of lawyers, but you perhaps know what it is and how comforting it is to have a lawyer who is a good one. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. He defends you when Satan comes and says, how dare you think that Jesus' death is enough for you. Don't you listen. Look again at Christ and all he's done. When the devil comes and says, you fool, don't you think you'll get into heaven, you moron? He says, no, no, look again at Christ. He's your lawyer your advocate. That's one word. Encourager is another word. Um, Keep going. Look at Christ. Now keep going. Look at the cross. He's coming back to get you. Now keep going. Those two words perhaps together um, define the the spirit is your advocate and your encourager. And, And we'll talk more about that as we go. He defends and encourages you. But how does the Spirit do that? How is he your advocate and your encourager? And I think it's by reminding you again and again and again of Jesus Christ and all that Jesus has done and said. By reminding you of the truth. By pointing you to the truth. And I think that's his primary role. The world doesn't receive him because the world follows the father of lies. And uh, Satan's attack has always been on on truth. And right from the very beginning, that's that's how it began, wasn't it? With Eve in the Garden of Eden. And by his very nature, that is what he does. But the Holy Spirit, in contrast to that, In contrast to Satan is the spirit of truth. And I think that's probably a bigger deal than you realise. The devil tells lies and people believe him and the power of Satan is found in fooling people with lies. Um, The truth is that God created the heavens and the earth. The truth is that you are not an accident You are the personal creation of a personal God. The truth is that you are therefore owned by God and answerable to him for your life. The truth is that the death of Christ in your place washes you clean. But the devil will tell you lies. And he'll say, 
um, you're not really answerable to God. Come on, do whatever you want to do. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. You will not die. It's all right. There'll be no punishment. And they're all lies. And you believe them and your whole life are then built on lies. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth and breaks through those lies. So you see God in the person of Jesus Christ and you live in obedience to him. So it's, it's not about intelligence. It's not about how much education you have. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit in our, in our minds and in our hearts, that we know the truth. Friends, I've um, discovered Audible, which I can highly commend, especially on the bigger books that are hard to read, you slog through. Some of you guys can read big, thick books. It gets past 20 pages and I'm struggling, let alone a 600-page 600, a biography on um, Bertrand Russell. But you can listen to that on Audible. And so I did that. And uh, Bertrand Russell, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, um, I found him to be one of the most intelligent and best educated fools that has probably ever lived. He knew everything, and at exactly the same time, he knew nothing. And it's a sad and tragic story of a man of brilliance who just couldn't know how to live. His children hated him, his wives hated him, and he died hating himself. He knew everything and he knew nothing. You mightn't understand philosophy, you mightn't understand calculus, you mightn't understand complex numbers, but you know the living God and you know about creation and salvation and eternal destiny and the Lord Jesus Christ, your King and your Saviour. You know the things that matter. You know the truth about those things. This new helper sent by Jesus in the in-between time speaks the truth that came from Jesus. He is the spirit of truth and he will make Jesus real to you. Well, there's the first thing. He is our helper who speaks Jesus' words of truth to us. Now, secondly, he is always with us. Jesus says this strange thing a little bit later on in John's Gospel, and I'm sort of going to steal it. You'll have forgotten about it when we get to it, so whoever's preaching on that day will be able to say it again, and you won't remember. But he says, I tell, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is saying it's better for me to go because the helper will come. Now, you might say, well, surely it would be better for Jesus to stay. Well, says Jesus in this passage, in verse 16, he says, the helper will be with you forever. And then in verse 17, the Holy Spirit will not just be beside you as Jesus has been beside you, he will be in them, in the disciples, he dwells with you and will be in you. What are you saying is this? God has come to dwell in you. And that needs to be said again. Jesus is telling you, God has come to dwell in you. In fact, he says more than that. In fact, he says that it, through the Holy Spirit, God the Father and God the Son have made their home within you. They've made their home with you. Now, you wouldn't believe that 
if that wasn't then said in verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There are lots of things I don't understand in the Bible. Uh, I don't know how the Son of God died. I can pretend that I know I don't. I don't understand how the Son of God died on the cross. don't get it. How does God die? I don't know how God became a man in the womb of a teenage girl. I actually don't get that. And I don't care who can explain it, I still don't get it. Well, I'll add this one to the long list. When God the Holy Spirit comes into their lives fully and permanently, God the Father is coming, God the Son is coming, the God who fills all of creation, the God who made it all, the God who owns it all, the Son who comes and dies in your place, dwell within you, have made their home with you. Okay, everyone awake? Look at me. Let's, you know, look at me for a moment. What do you see? Uh, two of my kids have uh, birthdays in November. And so, as is wont, you tend to look at baby photos um, you know, at that time. And so I've seen a few photos of me uh, back when Josh and Ella were born. And I was a little boy with a full, full head of hair and um, skin without blemish. And then I look in the mirror and I seem to have changed over the years. Uh, less hair, more blemish. Uh, if you looked even closer, uh, you would see inside me something very ordinary and sins that would shock you and that I would never own up to. But there's more when you look than you can see. The God who made me and who fills the universe has taken up residence in me. I am a temple in which God dwells by his spirit. And you can't see that. You can. We'll get to that. But you can't immediately see it. And so are you if you belong to Christ. I don't fully understand it. But I tell you, it's a serious thing to live in a society of people indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You're sitting with them today. It's a serious thing to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting Christian you know is so close to the living God that they are indwelt by the Holy One. There's a mystery. I don't fully get it. But I tell you, it's a wonderful mystery. And it's worth pausing and considering again. You know, if you're like me, we tend to think, boy, it would have been a real privilege to be a disciple. The old question. See, what's the, what's the answer to the question? I know, I know your answer. If I said, I've got a time machine, where would you go? I know where you'd go. You'd go where I'd go. You'd go back to see Jesus in the flesh and just sort of hang out in the background somewhere watching. Or, or don't you marvel at, at, at you know, John and his referred to 
as the disciple who Jesus loved. And we think, wow, what must it have been like to be that close to Jesus? That the John at the Last Supper leans back and right onto Jesus' chest. That close. In so many ways, you're more privileged than they ever knew. Well, they did know a bit later. You're more privileged than they were then. It's better that the Holy Spirit is here and that Jesus is not. It's better to live now than the disciples before that, before that happens. Jesus was only ever in one place. If he was in Canaan, then he wasn't in Capernaum. If he was with Peter, then he wasn't with John. If he was with John, then he wasn't with Andrew. When the Holy Spirit comes, God comes up close and personal. You are closer to Jesus than John was before the Spirit came. Which doesn't mean for for a moment that um, the Holy Spirit is superior to Jesus or has replaced Jesus. He has not come to upstage Jesus or to get us to focus on him. He comes as a spirit of truth, the truth of Jesus, and he shows Jesus to you. He He puts the spotlight on Jesus so that you see Jesus with the clarity you would never have seen before. Uh, Neil and I uh, went to Washington, D.C. uh, together. We had a great time there and saw all sorts of things. One of the things we saw was the Washington Monument, which strikes me as the sort of building that I could have built. It's just this white stick and with a window, one window. I've seen some great buildings in my time. Um, I think I could have done the Washington Monument. Now, having said that, it does look spectacular. It's this great obelisk standing out, uh, just staggering in size. But if you go at night, what happens is that all around it they have these spotlights that they turn on. And suddenly you see this white oblix in all of its glory. In ways, you see it with a clarity you didn't see in them, even in the day. As these spotlights just light it up in front of you. You don't look at the spotlights. You look at what the spotlights light up. That's the Holy Spirit. It shines its light on He shines his light on Jesus so that you see him with clarity. You are closer because he is with you. He is our helper, advocate and encourager who speaks Jesus' words of truth to us. He is always with us. Three, he is changing us from the inside out. I don't know whether you noticed Uh, Did you notice what isn't in these verses? That's a crazy question to ask. Did you notice there wasn't anything about how you will feel when the Spirit comes? Did you notice there is no indication that uh, you'll be necessarily filled with joy? Or you'll have strange sensations? Um, As if our emotional feelings at any point in time is an indication of any sort of truth. Uh, What is said? Just in case we sort of get sidelined to thinking, well, when the Spirit comes, we speak in tongues, or when the Spirit comes, we'll we'll be able to do miracles. No, no, no. uh, Jesus says here, the core change that comes upon us, and he says it three times, just in case you miss it. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Whoever has my commands will keep them. He it is who loves me. If anyone loves me, He will keep my word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. How will I know the Spirit is in me? What goes hand in hand when the Spirit comes? He creates a passion and love for Jesus Christ and he creates a desire to live in obedience to Jesus Christ. That's the mark. I don't glow. 
You can't look at me and say, I've got the spirit because I glow. But you will see it. You'll see it. Because you'll see such a change that I love Jesus and I seek to live in obedience to his commandments. There are pe- I, know, I know that there are people here this morning who were never even slightly interested in the Bible and now you can't get enough of it. You wouldn't miss a Sunday if you could. And the only reason you miss a Sunday is because you're so sick you can't drag yourself here. There are people here who lived only for themselves. Everything revolved around you. And now everything has changed. And you love Jesus and you live for others. There are people here who loved money with such a passion and now you're wonderfully generous. When the Holy Spirit comes to a person as the helper, as the advocate, as the encourager, there's this new force operating inside. And as the Spirit points you to Christ, you love him and your life is changed. He's our helper. He's our advocate and our encourager. speaks Christ's truth to us. He's always with us. He's changing us from the inside. And because Jesus goes, last point, you will do greater things than Jesus. I scratched my head on this one for a long time, but Jesus says it in verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. I'm going to the Father, I'm going to give you the Spirit, and you will do greater works than I did. Okay, now let's clarify this. Jesus did some pretty amazing works that I don't think you can top, no matter what. Okay, water to wine. That's hard to beat. Feeding 5,000, that's pretty good. Lazarus from the dead, that's got to be up there. He's not talking about those things. He can't be talking about those things. You can't imagine miracles greater than those things. But the essence of what Jesus did when he was here was not miracles. Jesus did not come first and foremost to do miraculous deeds. He came to bring in the kingdom of God. He came to glorify the Father as he saved sinners. That's the work of... That was his work. Saving sinners was quite different after Jesus had gone to the cross and gone to the Father than before. After he had gone to the Father and he paid for the sins of his people... It was very different. Up until John 14, he'd not done that yet. After his death and resurrection, Jesus' disciples could do what Jesus couldn't do. That is, proclaim forgiveness of sins to all and sundry based on the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That sins had been paid for. Repentance and the faith had been one. Calling people back to the kingdom from all nations. And so in Acts 2, Peter on the day of Pentecost preaches to a great multitude and 3,000 people are added to their number as they come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in one sermon, more people were added to the kingdom than the entire time of Jesus' ministry. As the disciples took the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the world, because of Jesus' departure and the coming of the Spirit, the gospel goes into the world in ways that it never went before. People flow into the kingdom. It's all because of the death of Christ. 
But now you have the great privilege of proclaiming a saviour and a king who has won. And we do that in Tamworth. And we do that wherever we go, to the ends of the world. And in that way, you do greater things than Jesus did when he was here. It's pretty astounding, really, isn't it? Can you see what I mean when I got to this passage and said, boy, there's stuff here that's hard to, hard to fathom. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. But I don't think I get it all. I hope I get it more today than I did a week ago. I hope you can grasp something of the wonder of it. I went, I went, to, I went to a graduation some time ago, and there was a girl there, and uh, she was there by herself. And I spoke to her, and she said uh, her father had decided not to come to the graduation because he had somewhere else he wanted to go instead. So he went. And her mother had not come because she was busy that evening with an important job she had to do. And uh, I, my heart went out to that girl who was left an orphan on that night, an important night. It's a big deal, I think, in verse 18 when Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He's going, but he says, I don't leave you as an orphan. He's risen from the grave, King and Saviour. He's placed his spirit in you. You're not alone. You'll never be alone. Rather, you're wonderfully loved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these words are almost too wonderful to be true that when Christ left, he poured out his spirit into his people such that the Father and the Son now dwell within us. We are not orphans. We thank you that we know the truth because of the spirit. We thank you that we are being changed more and more to be like Christ. We thank you that we love Christ with a passion. We thank you that the day is coming when we will be with Christ face to face. But in the meantime, he is so wonderfully close. He is with us and in us. We thank you for these wonderful truths in Christ's precious name. Amen. Okay, boys.